Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon after a long day in the classroom. So we're really glad that you're here. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm with my colleague Kevin Smith uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to session five of our um, professional development for content area teachers, specifically our science teachers. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lori, for the warm welcome. And we look forward to sharing with you today as we tie it all together um, with all the strategies we shared so far. All right. So with that, we'll get started. All right, this is our acknowledgement and disclaimer slide that we've shared previously, and it's just noting that we work for the research arm of the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, and we're at the Regional Educational Laboratory, or RHEL Southeast, and uh, we work under contract at the Florida State University. Um, so anything that we share with you is, um, we know is evidence-based practices, but it's not intended to mandate, direct, or control anything above and beyond what your state um, local education agency or school might require or request. And the goal for today's session is really, as Kevin shared, what is just really to tie everything together. And so we've shared with you over the course of the last several weeks, a number of strategies, comprehension strategies, direct teaching of vocabulary, lots of different things. And so uh, what we hope that you will gain from today is to see how those strategies actually can be used in conjunction with one another. So we're gonna use all of them throughout the course of our time together um, through a lesson. And so we hope that you'll gain an understanding of how that can work. Uh, you will have the opportunity to pr participate in a rather limited way. And this is where we really wish that we could be with you in a room. Uh, it, generally, we would spend certainly more than an hour, uh, maybe even up to half a day, really working through this lesson together. We would uh, allow you to engage in each of the activities and you'd be collaborating one uh, with another at tables. Uh, we are grateful for the technology, however, so we're grateful that we can meet together, although it be in a virtual kind of way. Uh, but that means that our lesson today, while we'll work to engage you as much as we can, will be pretty much a flyover. So we hope that you'll get a sense of how these things work together and how the lesson flows, and you'll have the opportunity to participate a couple of times throughout the time uh, we spend uh, this afternoon. And then we'll have a little bit of time near the end just to kind of debrief and talk about planning lessons like these. And then finally, uh, we'll uh, talk just a little bit about um, the content of our next and final session when all of our content area folks, um, our colleagues from English and from uh, social studies will join with us together and we'll um, take some time to share with one another. Uh, regarding um, the possibility of implementing some of these strategies in your classroom. And we hope that you'll have um, some ideas to share and some, um, some uh, stories that you can share about perhaps implementing one or more of these in your classroom. Excellent. Thanks, Lori. So if you recall, the main practice guide that we're going to draw from today is the Improving Adolescent Literacy um, Practice Guide. And the recommendations we're going to focus on, which we will tie a little bit of writing in as well. And if you recall, in one of our earlier sessions, we tied into the writing practice guide as well for secondary students. But we're mostly going to focus on uh, providing explicit vocabulary instruction. Again, we had a section, uh, a session on that. We know there's strong evidence in providing very explicit vocabulary instruction. So we'll talk about what that looks like. Providing direct and explicit comprehension strategy instruction. And we're going to share with you several strategies again, that you've seen before, but in a one combined lesson, and provide those opportunities for extended discussion of text meaning and interpretation, and uh, increasing student motivation and engagement, ways that you might be able to do that within your classroom. So the, all four of the five recommendations that we shared with you before, we're gonna talk about. Now, just real briefly say, for the fifth one, we know that there are students who are in your schools who need more help than they can get from any kind of literacy intervention they have in your class. So it is important for students who need extra help to receive that in whatever way they can. Okay, so again, the lesson that we're gonna share with you this afternoon is a multi-strategic approach to instruction. So you'll see multiple strategies used throughout the course of the lesson. 
And so we did want to share with you, there is certainly research and evidence behind this. Uh, we know that while using a single strategy may be helpful in helping to uh, uh, engage students in text and help them to delve more deeply, uh, the use of, of multiple strategies is an even stronger approach. And so it's more effective than using just one strategy. And it is in fact effective in improving comprehension of students as they engage with text in your classroom. Um, we know that the greatest effects actually come from using multiple kinds of strategies um, during the course of a lesson. Uh, and the, the next point is important, not only for those students that you encounter every day that you're delivering that tier one instruction for, so we, they need to have the opportunity um, to focus on reading, to engage in comprehending text, um, to be exposed to vocabulary. And vocabulary is a huge component of what you do in science. Lots and lots of technical terms that students um, may not be familiar with. That academic language piece is also very prominent in what you do, especially in, in your science classroom. They need to have the opportunity to build their background knowledge in areas that they might not be familiar with um, to make those inferences and use those comprehension strategies. Those um, engaging students in those processes is, is important and can really help them um, to gain knowledge of your content and to improve their comprehension of text. But also we know that students that perhaps are working below grade level, that um, their literacy skills aren't necessarily uh, where we hope um, they might be, they really, really benefit from instruction like this because as you provide scaffolding along the way and you provide that explicit instruction and vocabulary and you provide them opportunities to engage in text and engage with one another, that's really helpful in um, improving their ability to read and understand text in your classroom. And then the, just the, what you do to model um, these strategies for students and then also to really explicitly explain them and to demonstrate them uh, is really helpful for students, especially as we shared in building their vocabulary and um, their comprehension skills as well. So all of um, what we'll share with you throughout the course of the afternoon um, is documented in research and that's the foundation. So our sample, you see um, our materials that we're going to use this afternoon and we have those handouts available to you they're under handouts um, on your screen, and you can certainly feel free to access them now if you'd like to. Um, it's not imperative that you do. We're going to show the text that you need to access on the screen, so you'll have that in front of you. But if you want to pull it up, please feel free to do so. So you see the text um, that deals with artificial retina. Um, so it's, um, it's an actual um, press release, news release regarding um, artificial retina receives FDA approval. And you'll see the author there, Dina Headley. And then um, you have a handout on text-based question, um, uh, handout for writing. And so there's a handout there. And, and um, when you take a look at it, you'll see there are a variety of questions there and space for students to write. Um, then a directed note-taking handout. Um, you saw that the last time I think we were together. It's a graphic organizer to help students organize their thoughts and their notes as they um, engage with the text. And on the flip side of that handout is a question generation handout. It looks very similar uh, to the directed note-taking handout, but it's a place for students to record their wonderings. And so um, that, those handouts are available for you as well if you want to pull them up along the way. Um, uh, so they're there. Okay, so in beginning this lesson together, uh, we would begin actually before we even begin to access the text, we'd begin with this question. What impacts would the invention of a device that would provide restoration of sight have on the lives of the blind? And so that's just a question for discussion. Uh, to, to get students thinking uh, about this topic, and they're going to read a text that has to do with this. And so this is a question that students would um, talk about uh, perhaps in small groups initially, and then we would bring that back to the whole group and have a discussion. And when we do that, 
Um, and this is a pretty targeted question, so there's not as much danger um, of this as if it were a broad question, but we need to be careful that we keep our discussion five, seven minutes. The idea is not to get sidetracked or derailed before we ever get to the text. And so there are times that there can be um, hook questions like this, where we begin to uh, ask students to, um, to uh, access their background knowledge and talk about things without reading yet uh, that, are, that can be very interesting. And so we just want to make sure that uh, while we want to pique students' interest, we want to make sure that relatively quickly we get to the text. So, so then after, uh, here's the research that has to do with that. So uh, as we think about engaging in that discussion, um, then the students would have the opportunity to write and to then to predict what factors may impact the development and design of a technology based on medical innovation. And so as students do this task, as they uh, pull out their handout and they uh, begin to write and address this particular topic, you can choose to direct them however you, you wish. So you may just have them write out a bulleted list. Maybe that's all you really want at this point, because again, they haven't read about this yet. Um, unless you've done any work in your classroom um, regarding these kinds of things, they may not have a lot of background and that's okay. Uh, so you may just have a bulleted list. You may ask them, you can ask them to write in complete sentences. You can, you can tell them you want three to five sentences, um, direct them to write in paragraphs, um, whatever you think is appropriate but it's just an opportunity for them to make some predictions before they begin to access the text. And then here's that research that I was wanting to get to just a moment ago. Uh, the research does indicate that um, when students are taught to activate their background knowledge, think about what they know, make those connections. Um, we know that's the way we learn is make connections from um, new things to old things that are in our brain. And so when they're taught to do that and preview and predict and confirm the predictions, that does help them to improve their reading comprehension. And it does make a difference when it comes to reading achievement. So it's very helpful. Thanks, Lori. Uh, great job going over the topic question, predictive writing. Um, I'm gonna work us right into talking about vocabulary front loading and again we had a session on this earlier so there are a couple of words in this particular text and as Lori mentioned this is a press release on the initial fda approval of an artificial retina device that a company had created um, through national science foundation funds and i know i mentioned that before with you all but the national science foundation has a ton of press release and articles on almost every scientific topic you can think of because they fund science research on every possible topic. So it's a great um, website um, and it's free. Again, it's all federally uh, funded. So that's where this article came from. So a couple of words that would be critical for students to know um, in reading this particular article are prosthesis. And again, we could go into the Greek root it comes from and you know talk about word parts and context, micro electrode array, which again is pretty specific. Um, and again, word parts and context are important as well. And ophthalmology. Um, so again, all three of these words can be taught with both word parts and context. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ophthalmology and talk about how I would um, teach that word. So I'd probably start by letting students know that ophthalmos is Greek for eye. So that comes straight from you know our Greek and Latin roots. And ology, which they probably already know, means study of. So ophthalmology directly uh, translated means study of the eye. Um, so certainly you could teach that through word parts. There's also a lot of context for that word in the paragraph. If you have the handout, it's on paragraph six. And I'm going to read a bit of that paragraph to show you the context that exists for helping students ensure that they would know that word, which is important because clearly developing an artificial retina would be part of the field of ophthalmology, right? So seeing my grandmother, and this is a quote from uh, the Associate Director of Research um, at the Eye Institute that developed this, seeing my grandmother go blind 
motivated me to pursue ophthalmology and biomedical engineering to develop a treatment for patients for whom there was no foreseeable cure. So clearly there's very good context there. We know that um, this is a scientist who watched his grandmother go blind and that led him, uh, you know, it motivated him to go into that field he's in. Um, and again, he is the Associate Director of Research at the Doheny Eye Institute. So clearly there's a lot of context there. Again, his, his uh, job is to help develop a treatment for patients who they did not have a cure for so that these folks who are blind could see again. So a lot of context in that paragraph for the term ophthalmology, but it's a really important term for the students to know. It's a really important term to front load so that they know that. And, you know, I would just point it out. So this is what that word means from Greek and Latin roots. And then specifically, this is how we could help figure out what this word means from context in that paragraph. So there's research that shows that both of those things, again, um, contextual analysis to infer a word meaning the way I just walked you through and said, again, that uh, this scientist watching his grandmother go blind really um, pushed him toward going into the field. So a lot of context there. And then morphemic analysis or breaking down that word in the Greek and Latin roots, like I said, ophthalmos and then ology, there's a lot of benefit to doing both of those with words when we can. Okay, and, and we know that there are many words, and as Lori already mentioned, science in particular, there's a lot of vocabulary to teach. Um, so we know that students need to be explicitly taught academic vocabulary that's central to the meaning of the text, like ophthalmology in this case, and prosthesis would be another word. So locating the words in the text the way I just did, providing definitions as I did, and then helping extending meaning through extension activities or discussion, explaining how to pick up the meaning of that word through context, all of those are really helpful at increasing vocabulary. Thank you, Kevin. And I'd like to point out that in our question box, and I'm so glad you entered this, and Rail, I hope I pronounced your, your name correctly. So Rail says that, um, they would definitely compare and contrast ophthalmology and optometry. So that's really a great point to make and to make that, um, that comparison and that contrast between those two words. So that's a, that's a great, um, great observation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Really good point. And so then as we move on, so we've had opportunities for students to talk with one another to kind of orient them to this whole topic. Uh, we've had the opportunity for students to write, to do some predictive writing before they get, engage in the text. They've been, been introduced to specific vocabulary that's important for them to understand. And then as they begin to engage with text, we provide them with the opportunity to do some text coding. And for those of you that had the opportunity to be with us um, when we introduced this um, a while back, if you recall, there are a couple of types of coding that, that you can have students engage in. One is a more shallow type of coding where they just maybe put a question mark by something they don't understand or um, they put an exclamation point on something that they agree with or they think is important, something like that. So while that's engaging, um, what what we really want to get to is that deep coding that helps students really think while they read and to make some judgment calls. And so that's the type of coding that we're going to engage in with this particular text, keeping this question in mind, which factors impact the development of the artificial retina? So we keep that in mind. And then we have some portions of the text and you can see how, I, how we've coded it. So you see we've established three codes. H is for history. So as students work through the text, they're looking for anything that happened in the past that contributed to the development of the artificial retina. And then C is for current, and that's in that purpley color. And that is something that's happening right now, that is um, present and the present day. And then F in the green is, the, um, is for something that is going to happen in the future. So those are what uh, codes that uh, we established for this text to help students think as they read through it. And so you see 
Um, and, and I'll just explain some of our thinking as we work through. So the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, granted market approval to an artificial retina technology today, the first bionic eye to be approved for patients in the United States. And so we have some clues already that that is happening right now. It says that it's happening today. So that would certainly be uh, very current, okay? And uh, so when you look also, it says that the FDA granted market approval, okay? And that might cause students pause and when they see the past tense and granted. And so they need to be careful again to think as they read because uh, if you read the entirety of the sentence, they granted market approval, approval today. And so while granted is past tense, still that action is happening um, currently. And so you might have students code that um, as H for history. And that's okay, because then students will have a conversation and um, in small groups, they, they would work through that and talk through that. Then the next sentence, the prosthetic technology was developed in part with support from the National Science Foundation, NSF. And so that we do see the words was developed. This technology was developed. And so it's not being developed right now. We already have it. It's being approved today, but it was developed in the past. And so we can um, see that that is definitely H for history. The Argus 2 is, ma is manufactured by and will be distributed by Second Sight Medical Products of Selmer, California. And I'm gonna stop right there because you see two codes in the midst of that sentence. So you see um, the Argus 2 is manufactured by, and so we see the word is, and so that would indicate that that is happening currently. They're currently manufacturing it. And then the next part of the sentence says, and will be distributed by. So it's not been distributed yet, right? It's been manufactured. And if we recall in the first paragraph, it said the FDA just approved it today. So there's no way that it can be distributed yet. So um, we can safely code that in, in um, green as being happening in the future. And it says the company that um, is going to do that. And then, which is part of the team of scientists and in engineers from the university, federal, and private sectors who spent nearly two decades developing the system with public and private investment. And so we see here, they spent 20 years uh, developing this technology. And so this de is definitely part of the history of this uh, particular um, device. And so you can see my thinking as I work through Hopefully we would have um, some differences in coding. That's what we would want to see happen. And so, um, but that's important that you explain and model that for students so they can see that, again, you're not just, you're not just passively reading this, you're actively reading this and you have to make some decisions as it's being read. So this paragraph, um, we can't obviously code the whole thing, uh, but what I'd like for you to do is just pick one of those codes, history, current, or future. And as I read this paragraph, um, I'd like for you to keep that code in mind and just search for um, a phrase or when you hear a phrase or part of a sentence um, that connects to one of those codes, just if you would put that phrase in the question box and just indicate with an H, C, or an F which code that it is connected to. Okay, so you're gonna look for a phrase, type it in the question box along with the code that pertains to that particular phrase. So just pick a code that you wanna look for as I read this paragraph. Seeing my grandmother go blind motivated me to pursue ophthalmology and biomedical engineering to develop a treatment for patients for whom there was no foreseeable cure, says the technology's co-developer, uh, Mark Hamayam, Associate Director of Research 
at the Donahue I Institute at the University of Southern California and the director of the NSF Engineering Research Center for Biometric Microelectronic Systems, BMES. It was an interdisciplinary approach grounded in biomedical engineering that has allowed us to develop the Argus II making it the first commercially approved retinal implant in the world to restore sight to some blind patients, Hamian adds. So I see that Rail has started to do that. The first sentence she says would be history and would be highlighted in red, yes. So others of you, pick out a phrase and enter it in that question box along with the code that you would use. And another great idea, a phenomenon to use would be a $6 million man clip or a bionic woman, uh, appeared like science fiction, but then here we are. We have this technology now. That's a great observation, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to wait another minute or so for you to pick out a phrase and code it in our question box real quick. All right, well, we'll move on. If you find one and want to enter it, please feel free to do so. And so what students would do next, and we alluded to this, would be that they would, in small groups, um, gather together. They would compare their coding. Um, and it, it's hopeful that they would have differences in their coding so they can explain uh, why they coded the way they did. And then even if they agree with their coding, uh, they need to take that opportunity to um, share in their small groups why they coded the way they did and how they saw that. Because you, you could have students code the same code and have, the, have it done for different reasons. And so those, um, those conversations are really important and they're really powerful. And so then we see the research for this. We know that strategies like this have been found to increase reading comprehension. And that's really a matter of just getting students engaged in text. And so they're reading actively instead of passively. And so that, and then that opportunity for that extended text discussion, which will provide more opportunity for that here in a little bit, uh, then um, also really increases student motivation and engages them in their learning. And one thing that we just note as we move through this lesson, um, we know that this is relatively time consuming and we'll talk about how you can plan for this kind of work as we get to the end of our time together. Um, but just a note, you know, in, in working through this, it's really important to allow students to have these conversations and not to skip over them. And it's really, it's really tempting at times um, to skip um, the discussion pieces and just work to fill out the graphic organizers or do the text coding or whatever. Um, but the conversations really do solidify ideas and, and help students to gain ideas um, from their peers. And so they're, they're very powerful. And so we'd encourage you to allow time for that to happen. Great point, Lori. And uh, so think about all we've done already in this lesson. We had you talk about you know, what might it mean for uh, folks? How would it change their lives for uh, blind folks to have a, a device built to restore their sight? Um, we talked about some vocabulary. We had you do an initial predictive writing. Um, and then Lori just had you text code and have a conversation around the codes afterward to see if you had similar or different codes. So you've actually already talked about the ideas behind this text, learned some vocabulary words. Um, you know, wrote a little bit of predictive answer about what you thought might, you know, be included in the development of this device, what it might take to do it, then coded the text and rewrote it, reread it as you went back and checked your codes against a friend. So you've already spent a lot of time talking about the ideas presented in this text. So now we feel pretty good about having you write in response to what you've read because a lot has been done. And, and like Lori said, it's time consuming. So you have to keep that in mind. You want to make sure you pick texts that are critical to the understanding 
of your content. But in this case, I'd feel pretty good as a teacher having you write in response to this question, according to the text, which factors impact the development of the artificial retina? Because you've spent some time going through it. You've thought about the, the history of the development of this, what's going on currently, and what might happen in the future. And throughout that, you undoubtedly would have coded material that helps you understand those factors that might impact the development. So we'd have them do this after they finished the um, initial coding. Um, and you can wait to do this after directed note-taking too. It's, it's up to you. Um, we've seen it work both ways. Um, but in this case, they're gonna give you their categories that they think are important before you actually do the note-taking. So um, that's what we'd have students do now is do their first written response. So we know that having students write about material they've read enhances comprehension. And I've, I said this in a previous session, really all comprehension strategies are based on one of three things, having students reread, having them talk about what they've read, and having them write about what they've read. Every comprehension strategy I've ever seen employs one of those three techniques or a combination of the three. And we know that having students write about what they've read enhances comprehension. It has to. They're having to go back and reread, quote parts of the text, think about how what they're writing connects to their own thoughts. And it's not only true for students um, who are decent writers and readers, but it's even more true for students who are weaker writers or readers. So it's really important to have your students who might struggle with reading and writing to do this. Um, and it applies across all of the content areas, language arts, science, and social studies. So it's important that no matter what kind of text they're reading, that they take part in this kind of um, activity. So I mentioned directed note-taking earlier, and as Lori mentioned, we have a graphic organizer built for that. And it's just a way, and people use two or three column notes. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. This specific gra graphic organizer is helpful because again, it, cre it creates categories or provides the students with categories so they can take their own notes. So after Lori and I read this article, um, again, the question says, according to the text, how do the following factors impact the development of the artificial retina? So again, whether you do this um, before or after that initial writing, um, we came up with categories. So again, in our previous slide, we had the um, first response done before this. So the students would tell you which categories they came up with. So according to the text, which factors impact the development? If you have them do it after this, and I might mix it up depending on the class or the group of students I have, these are the four categories we came up with after we read this actually many times now, biology, technology, funding, and regulations. Those are the four categories we came up with that were factors that impacted the development of this artificial retina. And some of the notes we came up with, and there are many, and I'd have my students come up with at least two or three notes for each of these categories. Um, so in paragraph two, we already have two notes. One is for regulations. The FDA granted market approval to an artificial retina technology today. The first bionic eye to be approved for the patients in the US. So we know that's tied to regulations because we have the FDA granting market approval. And clearly, as Lori mentioned, they can't distribute it until they get this approval. Okay, also in paragraph two, the t and again, we don't need a whole paragraph in here because we can really just, or the students could just write a couple of words because they're telling us, they're citing in the text which paragraph it comes from. So in paragraph two, the technology was developed in part with support from the NSF, and that's funding. And there's actually a lot of information in this press release on funding. So again, what we would have students do is come up with at least two or three notes for each of these four categories, and then they'd be ready for the next step. Um, so again, we'd have you think about, are there other notes that you want to include? And again, I would have students come up with at least two or three per category, and there are plenty, because biology clearly has, you know, it's a factor that the um, scientists have to consider. This specific device only helps with one certain ailment of the eye. Um, it's uh, pigmentosa, retina pigmentosa. So again, it only helps with one specific aspect of, of eye damage or eye disease. So biology plays a clear role in this technology. Um, the article itself gets into the micro -electro electrode array, the camera that's involved in this, how it's really been difficult to do this because technology wasn't miniature enough 20 years ago really to create this device. And then we already gave a couple of notes about funding and regulation. So all of these things are important factors. So part of this, again, None of these are wrong answers. So what we're going to have students lead toward after they finish the directed note-taking 
is to come up with that debate where they're debating which of these four played the most significant factor. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's research behind the idea of directed note taking. We know if we give our students graphic organizers like this to arrange, categorize, and relate key information in text, that it clearly helps them comprehend the text. And again, they're going back, they're rereading, they're thinking about which notes fit in these categories, and that definitely helps with comprehension. Again, it's because they're doing a little bit of writing, a little bit of critical thinking, and a little bit of rereading, and all those things help with comprehension. So again, once we got you through that point, we would have you think about which of those four categories, or we'd have the students think about which of those four categories is most critical to the development. And again, um, we'd have a debate around that. So as you're leading students toward that debate on those four categories, keep in mind, it doesn't have to be four. With this text, we came up with four. You may only have two or three in another text. It just depends on the text. But you want to make sure that you try to do a discussion in a whole group. So what we're going to do, we'll do part of this in a minute. You want to take a poll to see how many groups agree with each position, or even individuals agree with each position. So we'll do a poll in a minute and see how many of you think out of these four categories uh, were the most significant factor in the development of this. Um, as a teacher, you want to facilitate that conversation and not dominate it. You want the students to, you want to lead the conversation, but you want the students to play the biggest role. Ask them to elaborate, ask them to extend what they've shared. Where does it say that in the text? Can you point out to me specifically which paragraph that is in, you know, and, and why you think that's critical to understanding how biology is most, the most significant factor in the development of this device? So try to ask them to elaborate. An important thing to do as a teacher is not to validate any of the students' positions, because if they know that you think one of those four is most important early on, then the rest of them won't defend theirs as much, right? So you have to make sure that you don't give your you don't give your specific thoughts away about which of those four you feel may be most important until the end. If you do it at all, only do it at the end, um, because you want them to justify their thoughts using the text. And then at the end, it's really cool to take another poll to see if after the debate anyone's mind changed. So did your opinion change based on a debate? And it's amazing people will change their minds if it's a good debate. We've seen it happen over and over again. Um, so again, that's something to consider. So what we'll do now, we have a poll, as I've mentioned for you. We're gonna open up the poll and um, we're going to allow you to let us know which of those four you think is most significant uh, category or factor to the development of the artificial retina. Was it biology? Was it technology? Was it funding or was it regulation? So we'll go ahead and open that poll and see what your thoughts were um, on those four categories. Okay, so the poll should be open. Go ahead and vote. We've got some votes coming in. If you could, go ahead and vote for us. Some more votes coming in. Good. And we know you may be just speculating because you may very well not have had time to peruse this article very carefully, but speculations are allowed. That's right. Yeah, we're good with that. This is possibly based on your prior knowledge and not your in-depth reading of the actual um, article itself. Fair point, Lori, thank you. All right, so we've got um, you got two thirds who voted. We got two or three holdouts or, or more. Go ahead, if you haven't voted and let us know what you think. So biology, technology, funding or regulations. Just a couple of holdouts, if you guys could go and do that. And it's a decent split, I'm really interested and I would love to see this debate, actually. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested in seeing how this plays out. And so just a couple of more seconds. We've got another vote coming in. Thank you. A couple of more seconds, and we will um, close the poll and talk about this. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So looking at these results, so 55% of you said technology. So I would set up a group where I have, uh, you know, potentially several of you talk, looking for notes on technology. So now what I'd have you do is look for all the notes that you find where technology is an important factor in the development of this. 36% said funding. So again, that's, that's really critical as well, as we know. So I would have that group look up all the notes in this article that point to funding being the most significant factor. 9% said biology. So again, I would have that group look that up. 
And I find this interesting, but it's pretty common in this particular lesson that Lori and I have done many times, regulations frequently get zero. It's not uncommon for no one to vote for regulations, and that's okay. It's not wrong. Clearly, the FDA approved this. It's right in the title of the article, but it probably wasn't the most significant part of the development of this. What this helps with for you as a science teacher and the literacy folks love this too, it's the whole critical thinking component. We've actually got a pretty decent group poll of, you know, college educated adults here and none of you thought that regulations was the most critical piece to developing this device. I think that's really important because you know how many of those literacy questions say, you know, which one's the best answer? Which one's the most accurate answer? A lot of the questions on your state assessment and a lot of the questions just on literacy assessments in general bring up that kind of critical thinking. So we could help our students understand while regulations isn't wrong, we know it is a factor that played a role in this. Clearly, it's not the most important one that technology funding or biology are the most important ones probably based on our thoughts and critical thinking after um, reading or just based on your background knowledge. Again, I'm sure many of you haven't read the whole article, but at any rate, just thinking about that, we know that that may not be the most important component of this. So it really helps with critical thinking. I would love to have this debate now and have you go and find notes and actually um, verify which of those from the article is most important. And that's what we would do if we had you in a whole group and had time to do that. So we know that this kind of extended discussion where you have students agree, disagree and justify the responses. Clearly it helps you filter information. And we've seen students who will cite, and I've seen teachers do this too, they'll cite paragraph and verse. This is why this is the most critical factor because they get into it. And sometimes people are dying to have this kind of conversation because human beings in general wanna be right and they wanna debate. Many people do anyway. And of course, as a teacher, what a great way to assess student understanding. If you see students getting into that kind of debate, you know that they comprehend the text. There's no way they can't because they're looking deeply at certain points that they are bringing up in the discussion. So again, it's a very easy way as a teacher to see that my kids get this concept. So you really wanna use all these techniques and drive into this debate when you have text that really is critical to the understanding of your course. And it, again, as, as Lori's already mentioned, you can't do all these strategies every day. It's not possible. There's not enough time in the year to do this with all the text that your students need to read. But in those critical pieces, if you take them through this process, I guarantee you that they'll comprehend after all these strategies in the debate, there's no way they don't comprehend those most critical parts of your course. Um, and we know again from research, a, a meta-analysis showed dramatic improvement in reading comprehension when students engage in that kind of lively and meaningful conversation and debate that we had. I mean, Lori and I, we've trained some of these lessons for years. Sometimes we'll have students or teachers come back to us years later and say, I know that my group was right. I know for a fact that that was the most important factor. And it's amazing when that happens because it's not like, you know, a week or two later, sometimes it's a year or two later and they'll still remember that lively discussion. So again, we know if done well, it really can help not just with comprehension, but certainly with engagement also. Thank you, Kevin. And I do miss the debate piece and I would love to be in that room with you all and, and be able to facil facilitate that debate um, because um, it is one of the highlights of the, of the lesson and we really enjoy hearing uh, everyone share um, their evidence from the text uh, to defend their position. So then, we get to the question generation uh, segment of the lesson. And so by this time, our students are really, they've been immersed in this text. They've had opportunity to defend positions and mark their text and take notes. And um, they've been back to the text multiple times. So they are very familiar with it. And that's really important um, because you have to be familiar with the text in order to generate questions about it. And for those of you that were with us, um, when we talked about this before, um, as a reminder, this is not just um, that students, when we think about these kinds of questions, it's not students going to the te text to generate or um, record just text-based questions. So this is not, I'm thinking of a quiz kind of question. I'm going to create a multiple choice question that could be used on the test. That's not this. This is um, 
when students really record their wonderings based on the text. And this just works beautifully in science because science is a field of wonderings. I taught science for a number of years and I know that um, you know, the whole scientific process is just engaging students in that wondering process. I wonder what happens if, or I think that this might happen if, and, and so that is science. And so as students generate questions, they're thinking about those questions that are precipitated by the text that they truly wonder about. They may pertain to one of those categories that you see on your screen that we've identified and we've taken notes on. Um, they may uh, have something to do with something else uh, that is uh, related to the text. And that's, that's fine too. So it may be an other kind of question. And so you see two questions that we developed. Will this technology help patients with blindness caused by factors other than retinitis pigmosa, pigmentosa. And so we know from this article that it helps um, people that have been blinded by this particular condition, but will it help people with other conditions that have caused their blindness? And so we believe that is related to biology. And then uh, from paragraph 11, what other conditions is BMES working to address? And so this company is working to address this particular problem. They've developed this particular technology. Um, are there other things that they're looking at? And so you see that's related to biology, technology, and funding. Now, I would say those two questions, you could probably find the answers to, right? And, and so you could, you could do some Googling and some research, and you could probably find the answer to those relatively um, easily. Uh, there'll be other questions that students record, though, that aren't as easy to answer, or maybe you really can't answer because they're philosophical. And so one of those, when I think about um, this particular text, is like, um, if, you, if you read this, there were huge investments of funds in this project, hundreds of millions of dollars, both from the government and from private resources. And so my question might be, who decides what projects are worthy of that kind of investment? Who makes those decisions? And a further question might be, um, so you might be able to find that out, right? You might be able to say, you know, maybe it's some committee somewhere that makes decisions on grants. Oh, and so another question might be somewhat related. Um, you might think about, um, is this investment worth it? Now, certainly, if you or a family member or a friend would benefit from this technology, you might say yes. As someone else who, you know, there's lots of different kinds of diseases and issues out there, is this the one that's worthy of funds? And, and so, again, just a wondering, a question. Uh, and to that one, I don't know that there's a really right or wrong answer. Uh, the students might be able to make a case that there are other conditions that are um, more threatening to mankind that might be more worthy of um, that kind of investment. And, and so a variety of questions can be asked. Um, some of them will be able to be answered and some of them maybe not so much. And so this is just an example of that question generation um, graphic organizer. Again, it's the flip side of the directed note taking sheet where students would record their questions. And then you can certainly categorize questions. You can categorize them by um, those categories that were on the directed note taking in the question generation sheet. So you could just put all the biology questions here, all the technology questions here. And I shared, I usually take a, a piece of chart paper and students write their questions on sticky notes and we just stick them in their categories. And then we can extend this lesson beyond um, what we have in the classroom, what we've done. And then you can also categorize them by the categories I just shared. These can be answered pretty quickly. These might um, require some additional research. And the, these last category of questions really can't be definitively answered. So we know question um, uh, generation strategies 
um, are very helpful in helping uh, students to comprehend text, as um, are the use of graphic organizers. And so it's those two strategies we've used in this particular uh, case. And then again, more research validating the thought that this is really a powerful strategy. And you see that last sentence is particularly highlighted. Question generation is an extremely potent technique showing larger effects than other comprehension strategy instruction techniques. And so very powerful. And then finally, after you've done all of this work, then you come back to your writing piece. And so now we have the question, according to the text and further discussion, in your opinion, which factor has had the most significant impact on the development of the artificial retina? So again, with this writing, students may defend different positions. And as long as they can pull their evidence from the text, and they can really explain coherently why they uh, feel the way they do, that's fine, that's right. Um, and, and this might be the piece that uh, you might grade, um, or you might work with your language arts teacher and you um, evaluate the content and your language arts teacher would evaluate the structure of the writing. And so um, by this point, students should be able to write something um, that is well informed and it's well structured, well thought out, and their thoughts are well conveyed. Absolutely. And, and our um, goals and objectives for today, again, were to help you understand how all these strategies might fit together in one lesson um, and to have you participate in a lesson where you'd see that debrief a little bit as we just did and then preview for the next session. So, as usual, all of our references are here for um, all the, the research this is. Uh, backed with, along with the article itself. And we're, of course, always open to questions that you have. And um, some of you have been good about emailing us. Feel free to email us. And uh, we're very pleased that we've been able to work with you. And um, please reach out anytime. We're always glad to hear from you. Yes, absolutely. And again, thank you for um, being with us today and for uh, joining us after a, a already long day. We'd like to wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday and thank you again for all that you do. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And um, someone asked us to email the slides. I think these have been going out to folks once we finish. Um, and if for whatever reason you're not receiving them, send us an email and we will send them to you right away. We certainly can do that. Um, so please reach out. And again, um, it's my understanding they've been going out to your state department, and I believe that they're being shared with you. Is that right, Lori? I believe that's the case. At least it's supposed to be. So I'll double check on that to make sure um, that y'all are receiving them. Good. But feel free to email us. We'll send them to you right away. The direct connection is always a good thing. All right. Well, thank you for all you do, and we wish you a very good evening. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you on December 2nd. Bye-bye. Bye everybody.